Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Arti Hida, session host for this session. We are going to discuss ophthalmic trauma, optimizing the outcomes. So I welcome you all to IOC 2024th, fourth International Ophthalmic Conclave, hosted by All India Ophthalmological Society. To lead this session, we have with us Dr. Gangadhar Sundar, and it's an honor to introduce him. He is Senior Consultant at Department of Ophthalmology, National University Hospital in Singapore. He holds special interest in cataract, general ophthalmology, ophthalmic plastic reconstructive and or vital surgeries, ophthalmic oncology, comprehensive ophthalmology, pediatric ophthalmology, lacrimal and thyroid eye disease. Uh, so with this short introduction, uh, I hand over the so session to Dr. Gangadhar. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arthi. Uh, it truly is an honor and pleasure to be back with you all. On behalf of AIOS and IOC, which is a great educational platform, I invite you all to join uh, this beautiful treatise on ophthalmic trauma. Keeping in mind, this is not ocular trauma, which means it's ocular and adnexal trauma. We have a star lineup who are all going to be co-chaired by my good friend, Dr. Purendra Basil from OTSI and APORS. Thanks, Purendra, for joining. Uh, Truly representative of ophthalmic trauma, we have experts from around the world. To begin with, we have Dr. Kendrick Shi from Hong Kong, who actually is a pioneer in a lot of chemical work and intersegment reconstruction, an academic and great educator. Thank you, for Kendrick, for coming. Followed by Dr. Tenko Ayin, who is from University of Malaya, who trained in Singapore with us and beautifully organized a great meeting last year. Following which, we now have Dr. Janice Lam, our own pediatric ophthalmologist, recently returned from more fields, who will share their perspectives. Uh, Amir, would you like to introduce Mehul and Parihar, and then we'll start the session. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Ganga. At the outset, I welcome you all and um, this for this uh, very great session and innovative session on ophthalmic trauma. Um, Dr. Mehul Shah is a uh, um, uh, 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 he is a wonderful anterior segment and posterior segment surgeon from Dahod, India. He has he owns his own hospital. He is a trained uh, retina surgeon, and uh, he has a special interest in uh, ocular trauma. And he has a lot of uh, publications also and uh, innovative classification on uh, pediatric ophthalmic trauma. And um, he has a lot of publications and special interest in ophthalmic trauma. And he hails from one of the finest places, Gujarat, in our country. I welcome Dr. Mehul and with us Dr. Uh, J.K.S. Parihar, who is from Armed Forces. He has served Armed Forces as a ma uh, major general and he has retired and, and he has special interest in anterior segment, especially in cataract and glaucoma. Welcome Dr. Parihar to this session. So let me invite Kendrick to share his perspectives on recent advances in uh, chemical injuries. Not so often talked about, but a challenging disease. Thank you, Kendrick. Thank you, Dr. Ganga, and thank you to the AIOS and also APOTS for the invitation. So I'll be speaking on updates on chemical injuries. So it's a common and true ophthalmological emergency. It really constitutes about up to 18% of all ocular trauma or ophthalmic trauma, if we use the correct term. And the majority of our victims are young men. Um, and so although we classically know they occur at the workplace, we also have to be quite aware that the home environment is full of uh, very noxious chemicals as well, such as cleaners, ammonia, detergents, and disinfectants. So immediate management is the key to prevent or minimize long-term disability. Yeah. Now, the severity of the damage depends on the type and concentration of the chemical, also the surface area of uh, contact, as well as the duration of exposure. Sorry. So the aim is to neutralize the pH as soon as possible, and that's with copious irrigation. Sorry about that. I had a flu recently. So the idea is don't delay. Irrigate as soon as possible with as much water as possible until they arrive to the hospital. 
<laughs> and after irrigation is completed, we assess the visual acuity, intraocular pressure, and extraocular eye examination. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so when we're assessing how damaged it is, there are several classifications that we can use, and one of the main ones is DUAS classification. You can perform it immediately after injury, and it does have very... <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, it does have a very good way to assess final visual prognosis. <clears throat> This is somebody with very good prognosis because the idea is that it looks at the limbus rather than at the cornea epithelial defect, which if you have a normal limbus, it does help to recover. <clears throat> Again, even grade three, where you have a very large epithelial defect, as long as the limbus, at least 50% of them, is remaining healthy, um, they do recover quite well. <coughs> And these are the patients with very poor prognosis. <clears throat> so what do we do after the initial irrigation management? We want to promote wound healing, reduce inflammation, prevent infection, and also adequate analgesia. <clears throat> the problem is that regardless of what we do, there are patients who have damage. And it can really de depend on how much limbal stem cell disease is damaged. I mean, uh, is is caused. So dry disease is relatively minor. Recurrent corneal erosion syndrome, that's where the wound, I mean, the epithelium doesn't heal very properly. But when you get to limbal stem cell deficiency, that's where you have um, corneal opacities and also cicatrization of the conjunctiva. So a lot of goblet cells growing over the conjunctiva. <clears throat> These are the mainstays of treatments that we usually give in the acute period, uh, anti-inflammatory effects and also um, antibiotics, followed by some pain relievers as well. <clears throat> we do give vitamin C, so a super dose of it. Um, whether or not that really helps, uh, it's a bit difficult to say, but at least it's part of our armamentarium. Now, if you get to some of the higher DUA staging, for example, uh, DUA stage four, you may want to consider additional surgery, and that's where we use amniotic membranes for both its uh, bandage concept lens effect, anti-inflammatory and antiogenic effects as well. So you can do it via the suture method. So the idea is you suture it in place. Um, in this case, you mainly have to cover um, the entire ocular surface over the bulbar conjunctiva. Um, in some cases where, for example, you have Stevens johnson syndrome, you would also want to cover the tarsal conjunctiva as well. But I think for chemical injuries, um, because the tarsal conjunctiva is not as involved, um, just covering the ocular surface would be quite adequate. More recently, we've been doing more conformer methods. So by using a conformer just to set it in place, it tends to lock up the conjunctiva and then we trim it. And then that's a sutureless method. You can adjust it afterwards. It works very well, even though the patient has to go uh, home, it doesn't tend to fall out. Nowadays, you can also get some scleral rings um, that are commercialized uh, that can also do the same job and may be less uncomfortable. The problem is no matter what, you still get patients with limbal stem cell deficiency. So this is a patient that I uh, recently treated one year ago, 70 year old patient, cataract, so very poor vision, um, accidentally took uh, something that should have been a uh, nail cleaning equipment and applied it to her eye um, and it burned one of her eyes. So fortunately it was only one eye. So what we did, was we tried to restore the limbal stem cells. And if you look at some of the different things that you can do, if you have a donor eye, meaning the other eye, you can have cultivated limbal epithelial stem cells, um, such as what was uh, done in Italy. You can also have um, allogenic grafts. But uh, what was um, really developed in India um, by Dr. Sangwan and also Dr. Basu is the SLEP, which is a simple limbal epithelial transplantation. And that works really well because if you don't have a lab, if you don't have uh, a lot of money, you can still do this procedure very easily. So ad added advantage is you know, has potential for restoring optical clarity, not just um, healing the epithelial defect. And you can even now consider allogenic sources as well. So it was first described by Dr. Sangwan in 2012. Minimal donor tissue is required. You only need about one clock hour of it. 
doesn't require a stem cell laboratory, so you don't even have to have in vivo expansion. It's a single stage procedure, and you can do it even in a resource limited uh, setting. But only works if it's unilateral, if you're doing it um, as autologous. <clears throat> So thank you to Dr. Basu and also Dr. Sangwat for the videos uh, that they lent me. <laughs> uh, you know, doing this is usually quite simple, just harvesting about 2 mm by 2 mm of a strip. And then usually done under local anesthesia, and then you can do the dissection in the other eye. So we've tried to do this under local anesthesia, but it is very painful because you're doing a lot of dissection. Um, so the idea is uh, we've done this case, um, the recent case under general anesthesia, much more comfortable. And once you've dissected everything, you can put on an AM and then start to form your different pieces. So if you're eight pieces, you spread it apart, use tissue glue, stick it down. You put a bandage contact lens on top of it. <coughs> and then you're done. So this is one of our cases. Two weeks after surgery, we started to see the inside quite well. Four weeks, we started to actually be able to visualize the cataracts. And patients about one year after surgery now, visual acuity is 0 0.3. So what we notice is that the keratocyte starts to clear up the cornea, and this allows us to be able to see what's going on inside. So now we can even plan cataract surgery for her. So um, what was quite interesting was that this technique um, was not developed to replace keratoplasty, but only 30% or less of patients who undergo SLET require keratoplasty. And that's because we know that when you transplant these limbal stem cells, there's also keratocytes, which help to clear out the uh, corneostroma scars. And so if you give patients, if you let these patients monitor them over time, uh, they get better and better. And a lot of them don't even need cornea transplantation, just like our patient that I just showed. So um, in summary, timely and effective management of cornea epithelial dam damage and meticulous control of the pathological processes uh, do enhance patient outcomes. We do have a number of studies where we're using novel agents such as lysium barbum polysaccharide to improve cornea wound healing. Uh, but ultimately, you still have to prepare for if it goes wrong, you may still have to do some uh, limbal stem cell transplantation or even keratoplasty afterwards. So with that, thank you. And uh, I'll pass the time back to the chairs. Sorry for the um, the, the throat problem. Thanks a lot, uh, Kendrick. You know, I appreciate you taking the extra effort despite your recurring cough. And uh, you have always succinctly put together updates in a beautiful way, from conventional to traditional way. Uh, just a couple of comments before I hand over to my co-chair, Mr. Purendra Basan, to talk about the challenge of chemical injury, especially vitreal arch in South Asian population and the challenges. You updated us on SLET, and you are probably trying to educate us ophthalmologists, not corneal surgeons, that even general ophthalmologists can now start rehabilitating these chemical injury patients. Am I correct to say that? Yeah, I think the idea is um, the way that we need to advance medical technology is that it has to be more accessible to everyone. So for example, even the amniotic membrane, you don't have to get a cornea surgeon to do it. You can do it sutureless, you can place it on there, the patient doesn't have, even have to be in the OR. Now, I'd say um, for SLET, the major issue is about the dissection, getting the right plane, and actually uh, giving a lot of patience there. Now, it might be difficult for a general ophthalmologist to do it, I think, both from the medical legal sense, because if you don't have a very good outcome, would it mean that it's because it's not your expertise that things didn't go very well? And I think the second part is also um, what to do next afterwards. If the patient doesn't improve, you still need to find a cornea surgeon. So I'd say maybe the initial management, uh, it can be much more generalized. But I think when you get to SLET, it's probably best um, if it can be limited to a uh, somebody with cornea experience. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Parit Basin. Very nice presentation, Dr. Kendrick, and you have highlighted very nicely about the chemical injuries and their effect, effects on the cornea and the uh, the adenexa. Uh, 
Uh, it was very nice that you have highlighted the role of uh, SLAT in uh, the recovery of the chemical injury patients. So, uh, what what is your uh, uh, say when when it is a one night patient, or uh, when you don't have a limbal stem cell from the other eye, uh, when bilateral involvement is there, and do we have any uh, uh, experience of uh, using a platelet rich uh, plasma PRP uh, drops in such cases? Oh, uh, Dr. Perenda, thank you for that question. Yeah, uh, I've been working with um, PRP uh, quite a few years ago. We were using something called uh, EG, um, it's a uh, endorat system from um, from uh, Spain. So we usually use that in the case of persistent epithelial defects. Unfortunately, it doesn't work work very well if you're giving it to somebody with thimble stem cell deficiency. There's conjunctivalization over the eye already. So uh, I would say. If the patient has a persistent epithelial defect after chemical injury, shortly after chemical injury, one option is to use amniotic membrane transplantation, or you can use PRP as well to try to improve the healing. But in terms of if you're dealing with an LSCD patient in both eyes, I think in that case, either you would consider an allo, allo slut. Outcomes are not very good, um, even as reported by um, you know the masters, Dr. Sangwan and also Dr. Basu. Um, I think in that case, you would have to consider character prosthesis instead. So like uh, oral K-Pro um, or even a type 2 Boston K-Pro. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so having tackled the ocular surface issues, the more challenging aspect is the posterior segment trauma. And with, with us to share her expertise is Professor Tinko Ayn Kamalden from University of Malaya. Over to you, Ayn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, wait a second. Let me just. Right. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, good morning. And thank you, Dr. Ganga. And thank you, the organizers, for uh, inviting me for the talk. I, have, I was tasked with giving a talk on challenges in posterior segment trauma. Um, got no financial disclosures related to the talk. Um, in a span of 10 minutes, I'll try to tackle five challenges. Um, firstly, Tinal surgery, supracoroidal hemorrhage, and keeping a watertight globe, and how to handle suboptimal surgical view and case of occult IFP. So, firstly, timing of surgery. This is just a list of the key list of the cases uh, of which intervention by vitrectomy is uh, in a matter of hours, uh, depend where possible, depending on the facilities available, uh, such as endophthalmitis, globe rupture, and perforation. Uh, because endophthalmitis, especially in trauma cases, the organisms can cause uh, massive damage in a matter of hours. PPV um, is essential in preventing PVR. Um, how? By removal inciting agents and by restoring normal anatomy before the onset of fibrosis. Ideally, it should be done within zero to four days. So in trauma, in posterior segment surgeries, generally, Within the first 24 hours, the primary team would perform primary wound closure for any open growth injuries. And if posterior segment surgeries were warranted, it usually is performed within 10 to 20, 14 days. However, this depends on uh, several factors such as the infrastructure available, the facilities, the expertise, and the manpower, and also risk of supracoroidal hemorrhage, and whether or not the eye uh, gives a poor intraoperative view, such as coronary edema. So um, Han et al. in 2019 um, developed a vitrectomy timing and uh, for timing for uh, inocular trauma, and they identified four risk factors for uh, high risk PVR. And if the eye, which is the traumatized eye, uh, which has these risk factors, but it's, there's no IOFB and there's no endophthalmitis, just these four risk factors. The recommended time for surgery to prevent PVR is two to four days. Whereas um, if the in the absence of these risk factors, it can be extended to 10 to 14 days. So timing is key. So next, the second challenge is how to tackle supracoroidal hemorrhage. So ideally, we should try to avoid it in the first place. And so, so the surgeons should be able to identify risk factors um, of developing supracoroidal hemorrhage, such as the use of blood thinners or coagulants, anticoagulants. And in cases of very severe trauma with large lacerations, 
or very large, con uh, very uh, massive contusion to the glue. Some tips is to avoid putting pressure on the eyeball during examination. And topical steroids um, hourly in the first few days may be able to reduce some degree of vascular engorgement. So this list is familiar to us. Um, I don't have to go to each and every one. These are the, the, the situations when we can intervene in cases of supracoroidal hemorrhage. Of note is when they're kissing choroidals and especially when the intraocular pressures are uncontrolled. Time to intervene is generally 10 days and that's about the time the blood uh, starts to liquefy and that facilitates drainage. And just a point on kissing choroidals is that if you wait too long, uh, there is a risk of strong adhesion between the surfaces of the retina if the surgery, um, if the drainage is not performed adequately in time. Generally, there are two methods um, of draining supracordial hemorrhage. One is by scleral cut down from the external side, um, and that's the brownish choroidal uh, fluid that has liquefied. And an easier one is possibly using a troca. Um, I apologize, I don't have a video on this. Uh, but this this is this black fluid here on the top right is the uh, blood draining out the 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 and the liquefied blood draining out. And the key here is to drain it at the point of the apex of the choroidal uh, hemorrhage, and that is identified using a B scan. And the advantage of using a troca is it maintains, it creates a tunnel, it maintains the, the fistula from the supracoroidal to the external surface and that facilitates drainage. The third challenge is to keep the globe watertight. So here I'll share a case of a uh, young man whose left eye was hit by a flicker of a small knife, um, complained of pain and blurred vision. So he had uh, injected conjunctiva nasally in a D-shaped pupil and a shallow AC as seen here. And so this arrow points to where uh, the laceration was. So a primary pair was performed and that's where it was stitched up by the primary team. Two and a half weeks later, that's how it looks like. Clear cornea, formed AC. However, he had persistent um, hypotony, single-digit hypotony. And now it's complicated with of diffuse with hemorrhage, so there was no fungus view. And that's how the gonia looked like, which showed cyclodialysis cleft at the area of the in, uh, where the, the, the injury was. And that's the corresponding B scans, which shows that um, the, the hypotenuse uh, picture where the retina, it looks like it's retinal detachment, there is fluid below the retina. But that's as a result of hypotony, there were no breaks. So, um, this is the video showing how uh, the repair was done. Um, I must credit Prof Gopal for teaching me how to do this. So first, um, I tried to identify the cleft by using fluorescein, but the water pout, the BSS was much clearer. We can see the, the break. So the cleft was repaired almost like doing a trabeculectomy, whereas the first bite is teaching the cylindrical body to the sclera, and the second, third, and fourth bite just zips everything up. And then the flap is closed, like how you do in trabeculectomy, and that's uh, at the end of the surgery where you just make, make sure that um, it's all watertight. And so his IOP climbed and he regained his vision at 618 by two weeks. The fourth challenge is how do we tackle, what options do we have to tackle suboptimal surgical view, and when does this happen? This usually results from cornea causes such as uh, cornea edema from contusion, hypotonia, high, high, uh, high IOP, or massive injuries on the cornea, such as the pictures shown here, where repair of it precludes, uh, affects the visual axis and precludes a clear vitrectomy uh, view. So what options do we have? The first option is by using a temporary keratoprosthesis. Um, it's made from PMMA. The pros is it provides a clear view during PPV. However, uh, you need your buddy cornea surgeon like Kendrick to come over and help. And um, you may need to uh, get a donor cornea on standby and that depends on availability where you are. The more modern option um, or more recent option would be endoscopic vitrectomy. And the advantage of that is it allows faster intervention. You don't have to wait for chronic edema to settle. We can actually 
uh, the earlier vitrectomy. However, the cons is uh, the original one provides a 2D image. Uh, the cost is high. Not every centers have it. I, I don't have it. Um, and that, and the surgeon needs to be well trained in using it. In more recent times, uh, the endoscopic vitrectomy is attached to a heads up display, and that gives uh, 3D view, and that facilitates the surgery. The fourth challenge is sometimes we are uh, in trauma. We know there's a foreign body, but we don't know where they are. And so I'm sharing a case that I presented once before, and some years back. I think it's relevant to this talk. Uh, this young man uh, who sustained right eye injury at work while hammering um, hammer to hammer. So I'll show you the mechanism of injury in a short while. And he wasn't wearing any protective gears. And so this is how it looked like. He hammered a hammer to a hammer to get a nail out. And a chip of one hammer entered the eye. And that was him on presentation. There was a self-sealing wound uh, from MM posterior to the limbus. So the imaging studies confirm the presence of a metallic foreign body at the posterior spine. So the PPV, um, during PPV, that was the entry area very near the fovea, and that is the magnet. So the magnet failed to extract any foreign body, and, uh, and, uh, and it cannot be vacuumed up either. Post PBV, the foreign body remained exactly at the same place where it was. So next, we sought our neurosurgical co colleagues to assist us by using the image guided system um, to help localize where the foreign body was, and that's um, that's him. And we referred to the uh, oculoplasty and optical surgeons. Again, this is a multidisciplinary uh, where. We did where they did the exploration, credit to Dr. Kamala Devi, Dr. Zarina, and Dr. Faziana, um, where they found the foreign body nicely tucked under the lateral rectus, um, under the inferior rectus, very near the macula. And that's how it looked like. It's flat, it's boomerang shape, and that's how it can settle itself uh, within the layers of the sclera. So it seems a cult, but it's not. And that's how it looks like after. So in summary, overcoming five challenges, Timing as early as possible, when possible. Within two weeks, supracoidal bleed, you identify the risks and signs. Keep on a watertight globe and consider options if you have poor view and um, use of multimodal imaging when you have a cop or your fee. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Professor Ryan. A very comprehensive talk and a complex topic highlighting principles, basics, and also cutting edge technology and the role of multidisciplinary team. You highlighted the aspect of high-risk PVR cases. In the past, we were sitting on a lot of these cases during delayed vitrectomies, but you're teaching us now the 100-hour rule, where in a high-risk PVR case, we'll consider going and maybe Amir can chip in here a little bit. Could you comment with your expertise on two questions? Number one, with Allied Health now doing a lot of intraocular injections, could you comment a little bit about iatrogenic trauma? And number two, a general ophthalmologist who does these complex primary repairs what should be the threshold to refer to a VR surgeon? Should you wait until you have a complication or should you refer prophylactically? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. And I think mostly covered all the things. I think uh, as primary repair, it's mostly done by our uh, entry segment colleagues or general ophthalmologists. So it's really important to refer the patient uh, rightly. So once you do repair, uh, it's really important for posterior segment surgeon or vitreoretic surgeon to have a look at the eye and uh, the patient needs to be referred very quickly. If you're not referring, I would suggest you need to review the patient uh, on daily basis. It's not like that you repair it and you ask the patient to come after two to three weeks. As Dr. Tengu has uh, nicely pointed out, initial time is very important. And even other important thing is that initial vision, if the vision is perception of light, even projection faulty, uh, when we manage these patients, we know that they also achieve very good vision. So it, it's really important that the timely inter intervention should be done. I think your other point was intraocular injections, intravitreal, you mean? or uh... Yeah, intravitreal injections. Allied Health is more and more doing these. Yeah. To a point yeah. of not being supervised. Any statistics, yes, data, sir. or personal experience on iatrogenic trauma? 
I th- okay. Uh, I think uh, regarding the, I have seen few damage to the lenses. So if your direction is not properly, you are uh, keeping it anterior in phakic patient. Yes, you can damage the posterior capsule and the lens. And sometimes the cataract may be very minimal, uh, but they become more challenging to manage. So it's better for the vitreoretinal colleagues to chip in and do this, those sort of the cataract. And other thing I think I would like to point out that uh, regarding the injections, you have to keep a sterile environment because what I have seen and I come across a lot of patients do come from other places with uh, post-injection endophthalmitis. And which is really scary. And uh, the problem is that the infection is very severe usually because uh, after the cataract uh, endophthalmitis, uh, infection starts earlier in the anterior chamber and that progress. But here you are injecting whatever the material um, directly into the vitreous cavity. So those cases uh, need to be referred quickly. Uh, first approach should be intravitreal antibiotics as quickly as given. And if there is no response, I think it's better to go ahead uh, with uh, doing vitrectomy. And it's a very good outcome if you timely manage those cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Purendra, question for uh, Dr. Ayin or any comments from your side? It was. Thank you, Dr. Ranga. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ayin. Professor, uh, it was wonderful talk from you. And um, it was wonderful and complete in its sense. Uh, is there any difference um, in um, a closed globe injury and an open globe injury management, uh, Professor Ayan? Um, like, uh, well, it depends on what is the damage, uh, such as vitreous hemorrhage. In the absence of retinal yeah. detachment, uh, you can you can opt to wait. But if it's an open globe injury, um, time of is of essence, and that's where um, you the, the clock is ticking. That's where you need to jump in. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Professor Ryan. So it's my pleasure now to... Any other question from anyone? Uh, uh, Dr. File. I want to ask it. Uh, may I ask to... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, quick question and a response, please, to keep to time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Saeed Mehul Kadir. I have uh, seen a patient, a metallic plate... Metallic plate impacted in the choroid. What will you do in that case? In the choroid? Choroid. Um, I think in the event that after trying from the internal aspect, like similar to the case that I tried, uh, I, I, tried um, I would consider going from the back, if depending on the location. So... I tried an uh, internal as- approach as well first because by the time it goes into the choroid, uh, the retinal has been injured. So you need to repair that first. Um, in the event that you are not able to remove it from the re- internal aspect, then as I think you might be able to consider external approach. similar, And then that's why we, we, we get the multidisciplinary team to help out. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move on. We can have some discussion towards the end. My pleasure now to introduce our own pediatric ophthalmologist. You know, I like young people, young people who are smart. And my go-to pediatric ophthalmologist is Dr. Janice Lan, who's done a beautiful fellowship after good local training on pediatric ophthalmology on pediatric ophthalmic trauma. Hi, thank you, Dr. Ganga. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, My name is Janice, and just want to thank the organizers of the symposium for inviting me to talk on uh, pediatric ophthalmic trauma. So today I will be discussing with you two very interesting cases of ophthalmic trauma in the pediatric age group, as well as um, talk to you with you some updates in the prognosticating of visual outcomes in children with traumatic penetrating eye injuries using a new ocular trauma score for children. So I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. Um, even though I don't mind some. So um, the first patient I'm going to share is a two-year-old referred in by the GP for poor vision in one eye, so in her left eye. This was noticed after she had presented to the GP following a forehead injury sustained when she was driving an automated toy car for children, you know, the ones with the very loud music, and hit into something, bumping her left eyebrow against the steering wheel. Her vision at the time on examination was perception of light, and you can see that there was a very white cataract noted in her left eye. 
So she underwent an uh, left eye lensectomy with vision blue, as well as a primary posterior capsulotomy. And intraoperatively, we noticed a very fibrotic capsule, and this required using an anterior vitrector to enlarge the anterior capsular opening. As always, I always suture my cornea wounds in children after cataract surgery. And in view of her age, she's two, I chose to insert an intraocular lens in her back with a posterior optic capture. So capturing the lens within the primary posterior capsulotomy I created. So interestingly, in a short one month from trauma to surgery, she had developed amblyopia. Her post-op month one VA was actually log mar 0.5, which is equivalent to about Snellens of 618, despite a very clear visual axis and a normal fundus exam. So she started on part-time patching with a good eye four hours a day, and at six months after surgery, her vision had improved to log mar 0.2 or 6.9 Snellen equivalent. The second patient is a 13-year-old boy um, who had, was playing with his friends in his neighborhood and he felt something hit his eye and described it as an immediate black clot blocking his vision. This was associated with pain. So upon arrival in our clinic, he was noted to have a periorbital hematoma with edema causing a complete ptosis of his left eye as shown in the photo here. There was a grade 2 relative afferent pupillary defect and his vision in left eye was only hand movement at presentation. So ocular fertility was limited in his left eye, on upgaze and full on his right. The anterior and posterior segment examinations were normal, and um, in his right eye was normal, but the examination of his left eye, you can see that his eye was injected with um, temporal subconjunctiva hemorrhage. The cornea was very clear, the AC was deep, and some cells were noted, but no microhyphema was seen. And at presentation, his uh, intraocular pressure was 25 millimeters mercury. So this examination of the left eye was very interesting. It revealed the presence of a central subretinal hip bleeding at the macula and vitreous hemorrhage. Of interest, there was a patch of very visible sclera noted superior temporally, measuring about eight disc diameters in size. So this had all occurred simply because his friend had a pellet gun and was just horsing around. So a uh, CT done of his orbit showed that um, there was a presence of a radio opaque foreign body, uh, but the globe was noted to be intact and no distortion was found. So it was reviewed by our vitro retinal specialist who advised that no surgical intervention was necessary at that point as the globe was well formed. Um, and removal of the metallic foreign body may result in more destruction of the orbital anatomy and tissue and hence should be left in situ. However, two weeks later, he returned to the casualty clinic um, with complaints of worsening vision. So his vision by now had dropped to hand movement in his left eye. He complained that his vision was cloudy again and at this point, the visual acuity uh, was only hand movements. He was found to have a MAC off retinal detachment with a retinogenous tear um, and underwent a left eye vitrectomy membrane peel as laser retinopexy almost 360 and uh, injection of silicon oil for tamponade of his retina. So intraoperatively, um, there was a very big submacular hemorrhage and corridor rupture at the macula and inferior retina and a possible tear at the edge of the uh, what we call chororetinitis scopateria which was what we saw just now, the superior temporal aspect of his retina. So at his post-operative review, 10 days later, his left eye vision had improved to 1.2 logma, uh, and the retina was noted to be attached. So these are the pre- and post-operative um, photos of his OCT, as well as his retina. So his parents were kind of concerned that the pellet lodged within his orbit contained lead and was keen for his removal. So the, he was seen by the anexal team, or the, what we call oculoplastic, for consideration of removal of the orbital foreign body. Um, although most orbital foreign bodies are left in situ, um, an MDT was held and the consensus was made that it could be left, but if the patient wanted it removed, we would remove it. But the patient was by now, then very, he was actually undergoing some uh, depression by the time. He's only 13 years old, had lost vision in one eye. So um, that was not much of his concern. So nine months after um, the surgery, his vision had improved to 6120 from hand movement uh, just before the retinal detachment repair and he's uh, currently awaiting removal of his uh, silicon oil. So why is pediatric ophthalmic trauma important? So eye trauma constitutes about 10% and up to 15% of all eye disease, um, and it is the lead cause of monocular visual disability in children. And why is it important in children? Because of its relative high rate of trauma in children compared to adults, and a few factors contribute to this. So children are naturally hyperactive, as we who have children all know, and they have some lack of life experience and self-protection awareness. Um, and the severity of trauma is known to be directly proportional to morbidity, and this affects the socioeconomic loss. So how can we, what can we do to uh, prevent this? So on the right here, you can see an ocular trauma tra terminology system that we're all well aware and familiar. Uh, it's called the Birmingham Eye Trauma Terminology System. 
And our first patient, a toddler with a white cataract, falls under a closed loop contusion. And our teenager with the pellet injury is a little bit more interesting. Some may call it a lamellar laceration of sclera posteriorly, resulting in chororetinitis scopiteria, or some may also consider it as a posterior rupture that was self-sealing. So I presented today two patients from two ends of the spectrum uh, with very similar presenting VAs of perception of light, but drastically different consequences and eventual visual outcomes. So we're all familiar with the original ocular trauma score described by Farron Kuhn and his team in 2002. And this was formulated to determine the visual prognosis in patients with eye injury. However, its application in young children may be challenging, as this can be difficult to determine relative afferent pupil defect or even measure visual outcomes equities in this age group. So hence, a decade later in 2011, a modified version of the ocular trauma score was described to prognosticate vision in penetrating injuries in children. So here are the two tables, comparing the conventional ocular trauma score on the left against the pediatric ocular trauma score on the right. So what we call the pediatric ocular score, we call POTS POTS. Um, scored VA lower than ocular trauma score uh, based on our consideration of the probability of uh, obtaining false initial VA scores, uh, inability to even obtain them in children uh, at a very young age. And likewise, relative FM privilege defect um, was not evaluated in POTS compared to the OTS. Other variables such as age and wound location were considered important parameters and were included in the scoring. So this trauma score for pediatric patients with penetrating injury was actually very strongly correlated with the predictability of its final outcomes. So as reported in many other studies, the most important factor that uh, affected final VA was usually initial VA. Um, however, if you take into everything in account, um, this new pot actually showed that the significance was a p-value of less than 0 0.001. And so it was very useful in pre-verbal children, uh, especially uh, from the effect of the trauma, so because it was very difficult to determine uh, VA injury time and shape of the injury. So because of these reasons, um, especially in childhood, this different classification need was born. So in 2020, the application of this new pediatric ocular trauma score was evaluated in a, in a retrospective study of about 90 children. The analysis of the POTS and its final VA showed impressive correlation with a p-value of zero, thus suggesting that this POT system can be a reliable tool in prognosticating final outcomes in children uh, with penetrating eye injuries. So just some take-home messages. Um, basically, this pediatric ocular trauma score may be a good or more reliable system to prognosticate the outcomes in children, where uh, pupillary examination and visual equities may sometimes be difficult to be measured. However, in older children, I think likely the original OTS is likely to be sufficient. So always remember fun is one thing, safety is another. So always pick toys that are suitable for the child's age, interest, and skill levels. Uh, choose those that are well-designed. And if they are going to be in any risk of any injury, do have protective uh, goggles in place. Always supervise them adequately. And remember prevention is always better than cure. So always be better to be safe than sorry. So uh, lastly, I just want to bring your attention to the World Congress of Pediatric Ophthalmology Strap that we held right next door in KL uh, in July this year. So please register if you're interested. And we look forward to seeing you there. So thank you again for your kind attention. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Very nice talk, Dr. Janice Lamb. It was wonderfully covered. Both the cases were of extreme ants. And... Um, uh, you have very nicely managed uh, both the cases. The first case was of a uh, periodic cataract tra uh, trauma at uh, the age of two years. So uh, very nicely managed and uh, you have highlighted the use of uh, the importance of uh, making the visual axis clear by doing a primary optic capture of the lens in the primary uh, posterior capsular axis. That is very, very important, uh, which you have highlighted in your case. And secondly, in your next case, you have shown very nicely to when to uh, keep yourself reserved and uh, not go further. But when it was required, when you know, the detachment occurred, you managed the case and uh, you improved the uh, vision. Very nice. Uh, the importance uh, of managing amblyopia in uh, these cases uh, is very high as compared to the adult onset uh, trauma. And uh, that, I think, uh, is very, very important aspect of management of pediatric cases. 
and uh, which uh, has to be taken care of and uh, uh, family and the parents uh, involvement and uh, into this is very very useful and very important and uh, periodic of uh, ocular trauma score and uh, prognosticating the cases that also you have highlighted and you have used, shown the importance of it so um, how do you um, calculate the iol power uh, how do you adjust the iol power in such cases uh, that i just wanted to know from you Thank you, Dr. Parendra. So, um, yeah, I agree with you firstly that, you know, um, and I highlight what Dr. Ahmed spoke about in the after the previous session was that timely intervention is very important. So in children, really, um, you'll be surprised that within a month of having the white cataract, uh, they developed amblyopia and we really needed to have um, uh, very aggressive amblyopia treatment for the child. So in general, um, there are many different, like, you know, uh, tables out there that you can calculate um, that, and goal um, of refractive correction. So aphakic correction in these children is very important. So at two years of age, usually above the age of two, I, above the age of one, I'll in, insert intractor lens. And I usually use the rule of seven. Uh, if I cannot follow, I, if I do not have like a table on hand. So rule of seven means that uh, seven minus the age. So the child is two. So seven minus two is plus five. So that's the aim I want to um, uh, achieve. So I'm aiming for the child to have about a residual plus five in the eye because I'm thinking about amitropization. So there's amitropization curve. So they're usually hyperopic at that age anyway. So you want to aim them to be hyperopic because they can tend to become a bit more myopic uh, with time. So uh, in these children, we'll actually counsel the parents that they will still need some glasses after the surgery uh, or if they prefer contact lenses um, to tie them over until they amitropize. So yes, so for this child, I aim for about plus five. Very nice. Thank you. Any question, Dr. Ganga? Uh, sorry for the interruption, sir. We have an audience question. Um, if uh, Dr. Uh, Tenku can take this question. Uh, this question has been asked by Dr. Anusha from Telangana. Uh, any literature, uh, recent literature regarding supracoroidal injection and what are its complications? Actually, thank you very much. I, I just I just typed in the, the chat box. Um, thank you for the question. On a personal level, I do not actually have any experience in giving any suprachoroidal injections. So um, I'm not able to give much updates on that. However, from my understanding, um, talking to some of my colleagues who, who give hundreds and thousands of the injections, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, because I think some of the panel here may have experience in it. Um, apart from bleeding, I think there is a risk of embolism if um, if if there is air bubbles in the injection injecting into such a vascular choroidal space. Um, yeah, does does anybody have anything to add, or uh, does anybody have any experience in this? Uh, it's Amir. Can I add something? Please. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. So yeah, we, uh, we do give. Uh, I think uh, regarding uh, the indications, usually you use it for diabetic macular edema vein occlusions, non-infectious uveitis, you can use it. Or some people in for, in for the cataract-related cystron macular edema. Uh, Complications-wise, is not as much as you get with intravitreal because the pressure issue, uh, the glaucoma uh, incidence is more higher. I, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's more higher with intravitreal. With supracoridal, the risk is less. Uh, apart from that, uh, I think not much complication. Initially, you need to remember that sometimes you can have uh, very high pressures that can lead to central retina artery occlusion. So you need to check the vision of the patient uh, there. And if you feel that the patient is uh, having no perception of light, always do anterior chamber paracentesis uh, to uh, drain some aqueous. And usually the vision comes back at that time. But apart from that, uh, even intraocular pressure related issue is not much. Uh, even I'm not aware of any other complications. Only thing is that sometimes uh, if uh, you're you're not using the guarded needles, it is possibility that transylonone can go into the vitreous cavity. So that again, you can say the floaters patients can get at that time, but gradually uh, it will resolve as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope Dr. Anusha, uh, you got the answer. Uh, I'll encourage the audience to pl please put their queries in the chat box and I'll bring up them 
to the panelists and the presenters. Over to you, Dr. Ganga and Dr. Purendra, sir. Uh, any question, Dr. Ganga, from Dr. Lair? Not, not really. Uh, okay. Let's uh, yeah, let us go ahead. Yeah. So please. So our next speaker is uh, as Dr. Mehul Shah is not uh, here um, you know, today available with us. So I will request Dr. Parihar to go ahead with his uh, talk on uh, ophthalmic trauma in conflict regions. Dr. Parihar, are you there? I'm just coming in, yeah. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Parihar is a wonderful, is a wonderful uh, ophthalmologist and he's from Armed Forces in India and has got large experience of uh, managing the cases from the uh, war front and from the fields. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, Purendra, sir, I think he's got some network yes, issues. Uh, I have his presentation as a backup. Uh, so let's find out if he is able to yeah, share his presentation or I'll share yeah, it yeah, from please. Yeah. Yeah, please you sh you share and I'll keep on speaking. Okay. Because I, I expected that be this uh, issue. Uh, uh, I don't know this. Uh, I think Pari uh, Pariyar, sir, you are sharing your screen already. <clears throat> so can you stop your screen share if you want me to press do it? Please uh, stop your screen share. So I assume that my screen is visible, Purindra, sir? It is visible. It is. Am I, uh, am I, uh, are you... um, sir, we really have a lot of network issue from your end. So um, if it is possible, uh, you can change the network or you can switch off your video so that the audio will be good. And I'll be running the slides from my end. So you can just let me know when you want the next slide to be there. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know, am I audible? Or I change the device? That is yes. If I'm audible, uh, then... Okay, Parihar, can better, you just switch audible. off your camera? No, just switch off your camera. You should be good to go. Just switch off your camera, please. Stop video. Just stop your camera. Uh, stop video. Oh. And you can speak. Kunil, yeah. if you can stop his video and then... Yeah, he's... He's, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for those technical. Thank you very issues. much. Thanks. Uh, no, no, no issue. Uh, as such, uh, uh, I expected these problems. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity and share platform with the uh, international faculties and my dear and uh, uh, very dear close friend of mine, Dr. Basin. Thank you. I have no uh, interest of any kind with this presentation. And uh, ocular trauma in war zone or the conflict, uh, military conflict has a very wide spectrum. And uh, I have just deliberately put to, uh, to uh, these slides uh, linked with, uh, yeah, slide two. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Yeah, this, thank you. Uh, this is uh, one of the medical officers. Now I wanted to highlight that the trauma in the conflict may have it wide spectrum. It is not that that you have a one person is firing bullet and other is facing it or some bomb and grenade. With the modern warfare where you are engaged with the uh, all kind of activities, low intensity uh, uh, warfare, then the, the terrorist uh, uh, attacks, then direct uh, attacks in the uh, ground, uh, air, and then the sea and undersea and the space. So you have a tremendous uh, variety of trauma which you can expect and here is a person who himself was a medical officer that I wanted to highlight that in Indian Armed Forces medical officers they are at the fr more foremost front and they take the pride to treat the cases or even on the uh, sacrificing their uh, own life. This was the uh, incidents took place in the Kabul where the medical officer was uh, 
engaged and he before uh, he could be uh, uh, sacrificed his life he has saved the life of almost 11 people in this particular uh, uh, happened in the kabul in the uh, one of the hotel where the blast took place and he was awarded the highest uh, military honor for the non operational uh, uh, non war uh, zone uh, activities this is the recent uh, incident the medical officers placed at the minus 40 temperatures 18,000 feet height in the July, there was a, a fire in a, a bunker. Now this fire, from where it has come, probably it was from the uh, enemy, uh, this thing, but not uh, was confirmed uh, accordingly. And uh, he came out of uh, during the fire with the five people, but then he had realized that here so many other people are inside. He went inside, took at least six people again, but he met with a severe burn and succumbed to the death. So that is the courage uh, we have uh, with our uh, uh, doctors who face and uh, manages uh, different kind of situations. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Yeah, please. This I have covered. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the incidence of eye injuries in the, it's showing the changing pattern, right from the World War uh, uh, first, uh, where you have seen that the number of eye injuries was uh, documented. It is all those who have survived. Uh, from there, these injuries, those who have come to the uh, different hospital setups, and it was uh, around 2%. And gradually, you can see that it has kept on increasing. And in the uh, documented, uh, declassified from the various countries, the 91 and the 99, the desert storm in the USA uh, fought uh, in the Iraq is a 13% and the Kargil war in India, it has gone up to the 13% of the percentage of the total injuries. The eye injuries had a, this is such a high number. Being the foremost uh, open area, this has happened. If you go with the uh, bilateral injuries and you see that uh, the number is very high. It is almost 8.5%. They do develop the bilateral injuries. Uh, next slide, please. This is about the etiology. Great, uh, initial warfare where the basically the conventional traditional warfare having the infantry uh, centric and armored and artillery. Those days, uh, the war was not too much uh, uh, having the engagement of the technologies and the air strikes were least. Nowadays, the pattern has totally changed and it has become highly specialized with the air superiority. The pattern is definitely changed. So here you see the etiology of different shells, grenade, bullet, mines and aerial and non-combatant. These all are ranging from the percentage wise. You see it is around uh, 6 to uh, 3.6 to 6 percent. It is coming in the different available uh, literatures. Next, please. When we talk about the uh, injuries, the types of injuries, it is uh, you can have the all varieties and uh, most of the injuries are the complex injuries. One more point I would like to highlight that we are not having the standalone anterior segment ocular injuries or the orbital injuries. These are the pine systemic trauma. Once there is a blast, you may have that the eye injuries are the very small, but the other part of the body, right from the burst abdomen and the amputated limbs, all those things may be added to it. So it is not a, uh, one person cannot handle these situations and it is a uh, extensive polytrauma uh, specialty management required in such cases. And obviously the first uh, in amongst all these uh, requirement is the life saving. And then it comes the uh, visual saving uh, uh, situations. Next slide, please. Incidence of uh, intraocular foreign bodies is also increasing because nowadays it is a the system is to not to uh, uh, kill that uh, soldier but to make him morbid. A morbid uh, soldier is a big problem for the armed forces as well as for the further rehabilitation in the socio-economic status. And that is why the number of uh, uh, these all plastic devices and other uh, acrylic devices are engaged with the uh, ammunitions leading to the higher incidence of the intraocular foreign body. Next, please. This is all what I have uh, mentioned about it. The cluster bumps, which have the uh, lot of uh, different types of uh, metals, non-metals, aerial attacks, naval operations, high intensity, thermal, direct energy weapons. This is coming up very in a big way. 
on, as per the norms, these two last two, the highest density is thermal direct energy weapons like the laser uh, energy weapons and the biological, chemical, radiological warfare, they are not in the uh, accepted norms. But to some extent, they, it has been going on. Nobody accepted, but it is definitely, it is coming up. And these improvised explosive devices have become the signature of modern warfare, where the leading cause of the injury and death of the coil coalition soldiers during operations, which has uh, endorsed in the Iraq and uh, other uh, uh, activities. And here, not only these are engaging the uh, soldiers, but since this is uh, having the bigger geographical area and the civilian populations is equally affected. And that is why it is very important for all of us uh, practicing in ophthalmology to be aware of that the modern warfare will not confine only the border, but it may be in any part of the country. Next, please. This is the latest uh, what has been uh, uh, published uh, in the literature the, uh, and claimed that the Russian military is using a range of weapons, including the thermobaric uh, vacuum bombs. They Once they uh, blast, they capture a the big, uh, uh, creates the vacuum. And that leads to the massive uh, uh, engagement in the area of three to five kilometer, where you can have a, all multiple kind of a barotrauma, physical injury uh, due to the pressure explosions, which is uh, like a small uh, nuclear uh, explosions without having the nuclear uh, energy used in these cases. Next, please. Here you have the multiple type of injuries, all patterns, all uh, right from a small corneal foreign body to the rupture, globe, vitreous hemorrhage, whatever you expect, you can have the variety of the spectrum of the trauma in conflicted homes. Next, please. As I've been mentioning that uh, the tra ocular trauma is a small affair here issue that the one of the soldiers, he has lost his all four limbs. It, has, uh, it is from the Afghan uh, uh, war. Uh, unfortunately, it's suddenly a young soldier of 25, 30 years of age. He lost his eyes. He lost his all four limbs. You can imagine how big uh, psychotrauma will be there and how difficult it is to manage such kind of uh, injury. When you have uh, multiple cases, you are not having a single case. You may have the battery of cases uh, facing this uh, challenging situations. Here is a small uh, corneal tear with the cataract. Probably it was away from the war zone. Uh, next, please. Now, here we have the unconventional, as I have been mentioning, these are the three radiation injuries, laser-induced injuries and chemical injuries, and their management depends upon, they are slow uh, kind except the chemical injuries. Radiation injuries are the delayed changes they give except the burn, and the laser-induced injuries, either they are the burn or the delayed changes in the cataract formation, or uh, there is a retinopathies, all those delayed, and you may not be uh, able to appreciate that these are linked with the uh, any kind of a uh, undeclared uh, of military operations. Next, please. Ocular radiation injuries may right from the anterior segment epithelial erosion, conjunctival edema and chemosis with to the extent of the latter scarring, loss of tear production, and all those changes. At posterior segment, you may have CRVO, CRA, CNVM, vitreous hemorrhage, right, leading to the TRDs and optic atrophy at the latter part of it. With the, with the paucity of time, I may not go into the details of each and every part of these radiation injuries. Next, please. This is coming up in big way, which has shown in the Iran and nowadays even in the Israel. Uh, they have also used this uh, laser and direct energy induced uh, weapons leading to the ocular trauma. Probably this uh, gag laser associated the intensity of this laser, which is used is much, much higher. And the way it has been, it is placed the laser, uh, this is placed in one of the vehicles away from the main zone and then it can uh, fire and uh, create nuisance. So these kind of a, a war tactics are in such a manner that you are not engaging in the zone, but you are creating either through the surface, air, either through the aerial uh, fighter uh, bombers, they can uh, use this. And uh, probably the uh, future we may have to say, more challenges with the laser and direct energy induced ocular trauma. Next, please. Chemical injuries. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, probably we are aware of with the chemical injuries in the factories 
and in various uh, occupational hazards in the military uh, setup it is not it is maybe the ocular hazards but the chemical weapons have been used though it is banned by geneva convention but uh, it has been used uh, in uh, though claimed that iraq iran war uh, it was used and in afghanistan it was used and there are the claim that even the, the possibilities of the chemical weapons used by both the uh, forces in the russia ukraine war cannot be ruled out next please to conclude ocular trauma has a high rate of combat injuries advances in the weaponry has increased and changed the life of old clinical management of the evisations have all have been decreased due to the better management tactics and available facilities next please next please next please and obviously thank you very much thanks a lot thank you very thank much andra uh, parihar well, you highlighted the fact that war is not a thing of the past unfortunately it continues even now and it is not just a disease of uh, that happens to the common man but literally people at the front lines protecting their own nations and values uh, you have highlighted the fact that ophthalmic trauma training now has to be imparted and reinforced and continued to be maintained amongst all ophthalmologists regardless of whether they are from developed or developing nations because residual deformities again is another aspect which is going to be there as a residue of war so thank you very much dr parikar kurendra over to you thank you uh thank you um dr parihar it was a nice talk and uh, all these uh, cases uh, they what you have shown they tell us that uh, the, the 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 damage is more devastating as compared to the uh, trauma non combat traumas thank you dr parihar let us move further thank to our case presentations because of the paucity of time we should uh, now i i give it to you, dr ganga Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much. After these great, beautiful talks, we have three interesting case presentations, challenging case presentations. To begin with, we had Fahad Kamal, uh, a recent uh, AIPORTS member from Pakistan, whom I had the pleasure of uh, meeting and interacting with uh, last year in Lahore. Uh, followed which, we're going to have Dr. Marianne uh, Romero from Singapore. I'm going to talk about a COVID case, so let's we'll talk a little bit about it. And finally, our own friend, Dr. Delphitri Lutfi from Surabaya, my favorite Indonesian city. Sorry, Geeta, about that. Uh, and we have an expert group of panelists here, Dr. Syed Mehboob Ul Khadir, Dr. Amir Awan, Dr. Geeta Lisa, of course, Dr. Maurya, and Dr. Purnima. Start off, Fahid. Okay, thank you. Please unmute yourself and share your screen, please. Try to stick to the three to four minutes if you don't mind, and then so you have a good discussion. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. I am Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganga, for inviting me on this form. Uh, my case uh, here is about the lid trauma and uh, unfortunately we deal with more than 800 bike injuries daily. Uh, in this case, a 15 year old male uh, boy who had dealt with the road traffic accident and obviously he was wearing no helmet and at the time the in emergency the general anesthesia was not available. After the assessment from the neurosurgery department, we have uh, we came to know that the load lit and the there was a massive trauma uh, occurring the load lit and also the it was on X-ray it was uh, revealed that the mandible is fractured. So unfortunately, there was no maxillofacial department in our hospital. So it was decided first to repair this and then referred for the maxillofacial surgery. 
so our goal was the of the restoration was to educate eyelid function and the anatomy and also for the cornea and the globe protection and achieve acceptable aesthetic results so when we drape and this so then we found that fortunately the globe has been preserved so we go with the wound extent and the cerebral debridement clean and the aseptic wash with the hydrogen peroxide and you can see that all of the upper cheek muscles are visible in this uh, screen so the surgical objective in this was to the anatomy restoration so for by the assessment of viable tissue and that i called is that a jigsaw puzzle just like so we solved the first uh, part of the jigsaw puzzle and we came to know that there was no skin loss and the tissue here and the muscles here are ample to reconstruct so the other uh, surgical objective was to restore the lid movement so for that we have the educate orbicularis and educate retractor muscle function and the supple and the thin skin that can move the lid excursion so you can appreciate this that the orbicularis but it's the tear but it's there and also the skin and the lid margin is there so we dissect and then uh, identify the layer of orbicularis and then repair it after that the the lid margin and the structure in, is very much needed for the structure integrity because it provide the rashness or the stable lid margin to to protect the cornea from the skin here and also ensure the eyelid apposition to the globe so for and then the lid margins was were identified and repaired by the vicral suture the then the other surgical objective was to fix the canthus and for that purpose we use the ethy bond the uh, polyester suture to properly fix the medial canthus for this and after fixing the medial canthus so here then we identified that the punctum is there so the next objective was to restore the lacrimal drainage system and for that purpose we don't have uh, the mini monoca or the stunt there so we use the iv set cannula to identify the canaliculi and then repair it over this so the then the medial canthus was formed lid margin repaired and it's still there and after that repair the it was stayed there and uh, the part was cut and it is stable stayed there for two weeks this is the first week follow up and this was the second week follow up Dr. so Pahad, take home message case, yeah and uh, any questions that you want to ask thank you thank you Dr. Mehboob so, and Dr. Rajendra, can you discuss this case, please? Dr. Maria, please. Dr. Maria? Dr. Ganga, please, uh, you, you discuss in the meantime. You please proceed. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Fahad. Uh, Mehboob, if you're there, do join and chip in. Uh, uh, you're right in the sense that, Dr. Fath, it is quite challenging when you have what I call as oculofacial injuries or Ocular orbitofacial facial. injuries. In terms of prioritizing the eyelid versus the mandible versus the polytrauma patient with the rest of their chest injuries, limb injuries, and so on and so forth. So assuming the life is stable, you have rightly identified the important pearl in trauma is that most lid lacerations, the tissues are almost always preserved unless it is like an animal bite or a human bite injury, there's this complete tissue yeah. available. 
identifying the landmarks of the punctum, the lid margin, the canthal tendons, medial and the lateral canthal tendons. And you also identified the point that any medial canthal injury, lacrimal drainage system has to be addressed. You have improvised and tried to use an IV cannula for canalical intubation, but centers of excellence should slowly start adopting dedicated canalicular intubation systems, monocanalicular, bicanalicular. So thank you very much for sharing the case. Can thank you. you. And can I invite Dr. Marianne to talk about a COVID period case, which maybe I'll have uh, Dr. Geeta and uh, Dr. Purnima discuss the case then. Okay, um, a very good uh, afternoon from Singapore, a good morning to our friends in India, and a good day to everyone else joining in from all around the world. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm Marianne Romero from the National University Hospital in Singapore. And today on behalf of my mentor, Dr. Ganga, um, we would like to present an unfortunate case of trauma involving a bespectacled young girl. So our patient is a seven-year-old girl who just entered primary school and was headed home from school one day with her mom on the sidewalk, um, but unfortunately encountered a bicyclist who was coming from the other side, um, who was a delivery rider. And unfortunately, um, they collided and she sustained significant impact um, over the left side of her face. When she came to us, um, there was a um, significant injury to her eyelids. She had two significant lacerations across her upper lid, um, one running medially towards the medial canthal region and the other one across the center of the eyelid. Um, she presented with 660 vision in the involved eye, which was on the left side, uh, with no relative afferent pupillary defect as checked by reverse. Um, and significantly, there was also a corneal scleral laceration that was seen medially with iris prolapse from a corneal wound at nine o'clock. And there was also associated hyphema in the anterior chamber. Um, the ocular trauma score, as we're all familiar with, was proposed by Kuhn et al. Um, back in the early 2000s, and it provides a simple scoring system uh, with few variables for us to predict um, the final visual outcome of an injured eye. So it's actually quite a good aid for ophthalmologists to triage, manage, and counsel patients. And in our patient, we calculated at a score of 67 uh, with an initial raw score of 90 because she presented with 660 or 2200 vision. Um, she had globe rupture, which takes away about 23 points, but did not have endophthalmitis, a perforating injury, retinal detachment, or an RAPD. And if we base it on a raw score of 60, 67, she has overall an OTS score of, th of 3, which puts her at about having a 44% chance of having a 2040 or 612 or better vision at about 6 months. Um, so we'll go back to the case. Um, she had uh, imaging done uh, quite immediately after presenting to us. And you can see from the images here, uh, they are uh, presented in the soft tissue window in the axial, coronal, as well as the sagittal cut. Um, and we see quite obviously that there is irregularity of the globe, um, confirming the presence of an open globe injury. There's no vitreous hemorrhage or retrobulbar hemorrhage seen, thankfully. Um, and in the bony window, we note that there is a blowout fracture involving the medial wall that is, that is minimally displaced, but thankfully no other significant orbital wall or facial um, fractures, um, and thankfully as well, no traumatic brain injury. So she underwent an examination under anesthesia, um, a left open globe and upper eyelid laceration repair uh, emergently. And intraoperatively, it was noted that she had a left upper canalicular laceration as well. And this was um, in the same sitting, repaired with bicanalicular intubation performed as well. You see here at post-op day five that she has watertight corneal sutures um, present. Um, the, corneal, the scleral lacerations are also repaired. Um, and you can see a faint hint of the proline sutures here um, that were used to repair the lid laceration. Um, after the, after the initial uh, open globe repair, she was followed up and it was noted that she had no retinal detachment on a post-op B scan, but she did have a dislocated lens in the vitreous cavity. At about 12 days after the initial presentation, she had a vitrectomy and lens removal and she was left aphasic. 
She was subsequently fitted with AVK contact lenses after the corneal suture removal, and she was able to achieve a best corrected vision of about 624, about four months after injury. Um, the bicanalicular Crawford tube was removed about six months after injury. So you can see here um, at the photo, the lower photo that she had a lens removal done. There's some residual soft lens material seen, but otherwise um, the rest of the cornea is relatively clear except for the corneal scarring across the visual axis. Um, she had subsequently a secondary intraocular lens implantation performed six, about nine months after the initial injury. And she was um, able to achieve about 618 best corrected vision in that eye. And initially, there were concerns of um, possible amblyopia on the left eye. And she was commenced with patching therapy. However, the visual acuity remained about 618 despite patching of the fellow eye. And um, there was a pinhole visual acuity check for her, uh, which showed that she, she had actually significant improvement of vision by about two lines with pinhole and a pentacam that was uh, done for her showed significant corneal scarring and irregular astigmatism, possibly impacting her best corrected vision. So she was commenced on um, topical steroid eye drops. Um, the latest review was actually just about a few weeks ago, and we have with us here uh, now a 10-year-old girl. She's about two and a half um, years post-injury. Uh, we met, we've managed to get her down to 615 uh, for best corrected vision on the left side. She does have a left exotropia um, intermittently, but overall we have with us quite a happy patient um, that has relatively good visual outcome. I think we have a few questions for our expert panelists today. And basically, we'd like to find out what are your views on the role of spectacles and materials of lenses as protective eyewear? Um, secondly, if we have a patient with concurrent globe and ocular and nexal um, injury, how should we approach the repair? And finally, if there is a significant orbital fracture that also requires repair, uh, when would be a good time to go in for the fracture repair in relation to the other ongoing ocular injuries? Thanks, Marianne. Uh, Dr. Gita and Dr. Purnima, can you give your expert comments, please? Uh, thank you, Dr. Murray. It was, the case was so well managed. Uh, regarding the glasses, I also used to wonder, like after doing inoculation for retinoblastoma, I tell all the children that they should wear protective glasses. But sometimes I used to wonder whether whether the uh, child falls down because the child doesn't have a BSB, a single vision, and falls down and the glass itself causes, causes trauma. So you have brought up an important question. So in my opinion, maybe in the past, the spectacular lenses were made up of like really glass, so which is more uh, likely to break. Whereas now they, nowadays, the material, I don't know what it's called, but it's more of like a plastic thing, so which is also lightweight, and then it is less chance of actually breaking and causing uh, a significant injury. But still, uh, you know, I don't know how much the the injury to the, with the glasses also depends on maybe the frames, the metallic frames or rimless ones may cause more damage than the plastic ones. But nevertheless, it it helps in protecting the eyes, especially in children with the pencil injury or like that. And also in those cases, we need to look for foreign bodies. Obviously, uh, the glass pieces may not be visible on the CT scan. Also, so we need to be really careful. Uh, and your second question on perpendicular laceration. Um, generally, it is said that only 20% of the tear flows from the upper canaliculus, as from the lower. But I think it's not true for many patients. So uh, even though it's an upper canalicular injury, we should still go and re try to repair it and use a uh, monoconalicular or a stent or mini monoca or something like that. We should always aim for the repair, whether it is just an upper for a conalicular injury. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Dr. Gita, any questions yes, from your perspective? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, i just like to say that uh, I think uh, this is very good management. Yeah, um, I think uh, for us, uh, for me, I also prefer to do the, the primary repair at the first sitting. So we do the uh, eyelid at Nexal trauma first, and then we do the intraocular repairs, so the, the corneal rupture repair. 
and afterwards maybe we could do an ultrasound to rule out any uh, foreign body. And in this case, there's complication of uh, lens dislocation to the posterior segment. So, uh, but I think it's important that we have all the open globe injuries addressed first. Maybe we could uh, have the advantage of waiting until the uh, corneal edema and so the inflammation has uh, subsided a bit, and then we go in for uh, the vitrectomy. So uh, I think uh, it's uh, as demonstrated in, in your case, that uh, the, the timeline, the timing, quite ideal and results in a, a good good outcome. So uh, kudos to, to your team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gita. In the interest of time, let's have Dr. Delphi Tree from Surabaya to, to, to share her case of uh, uh, trauma for Dr. Mehboob, who's back, and Dr. Rajendra, who's back, to discuss the case, please. Go ahead, Dr. Delphi Tree. Thank you, Dr. Ganga. Can you see can you see my slide? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, all. Uh, I'm Delfitri from Surabaya. So and thank you, Dr. Ganga, and also the IOS committee for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to share about penetrating eye injury, the kitchen knife step. So this case about 20-year-old male uh, who come to an, our emergency department with ocular pain and bleeding in the left eye. He stabbed with a kitchen knife six hours earlier by his uh, his little brother. And the knife blade was already been taken by the stabber right away. And he have a difficult to open the eyelid and also, also absent of nausea and vomiting. So this is the kitchen uh, knife. From the examination from the primary survey, the glass glaucoma scale is 15 and without sign, without sign within normal limit. From the inspection, we can see there are seven centimeter laceration extending vertically from eyebrow to eyelid with orbital fat prolapse. And also he have a difficult to open the eyelid. So we need help to open the eyelid and the visual acuity on the left eye is no light perception with limited ocular movement. And also we can see 360 degrees of subconjunctival hemorrhage and also complete hyphema. There are no signs of laceration in the anterior segment. So we perform the imaging uh, for the head and orbit with a contrast. So from the uh, axial section, we can see that there are collapse group. We can see there are mushroom sign. This is the sign of the glove rupture or laceration. And also we can see the intra and extraconal hemorrhage. And from the bone window, we can see there are a left greater spinal fracture. And also there are a brain injury on the temporal and frontoparietal lobe with the hematoma. So we assess the patient with three conditions, the brain injury and penetrating orbital trauma and also open globe injury with type B penetration, grade 5 no light perception, zone 3, and the score of OTS is 37, so it's ocular trauma score 1. So we perform the surgery with the neurosurgeon for the penetrating orbital trauma. The neurosurgeon wants us to have the anterior approach to assess the orbital roof, especially the spinoid wing. So we perform the superior vertical lead split orbitotomy. So the neurosurgeon can uh, find the small fracture on the spinoid wing and also small LCS leakage. And he closed uh, the fracture with bone wax. And for the globe injury, after the exploration, we found the full thickness, full thickness scleral laceration, 2 cm.07, and also prolapse of intraocular contents, especially on the posterior segment, more than 50%. So uh, we performed the enucleation. We already did the informed consent uh, before to the patient and the family, and we placed the conformer. After that, we closed, uh, we closed the eyelid with layer by layer. So this is the follow-up six weeks after the surgery. And the two months follow-up, we can see that the conformer is uh, still there. We send the patient to the, our ocularist. And this is the condition of the patient two months after the follow-up. So the key point of the case, uh, the cases is penetrating eye injury sometimes challenging. And depending on the severity of the injury and organ involvement, it could be brain, orbit, or globe. Uh, so it needs it need multidiscipline approach. And imaging is mandatory to evaluate the orbit, and also ocular prothesis can help to improve the appearance of the patient. And I have some question for the discussion. Uh, in this case, uh, we cannot save the eyeball, so uh, I'm still wondering: is it still uh, possible to save the eyeball? 
And if not, uh, which one is better, effisceration or enucleation? And for the orbital implant, uh, it should be in the first setting, one stage or two stage. Uh, in this case, I did not uh, uh, put the orbital implant. And also for to assess the orbital roof. Is there any other way? Maybe sometimes a vertical lead split orbitotomy could be challenging. So I would acknowledge my colleagues, uh, my neurosurgeon and ocularist, also my colleagues and my residents uh, who helped me to do these cases. Thank you so much for your kind listening and I will go back for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Delphetri. I'm so glad I'm not the discussant on the case. Uh, Dr. Mebu, can you try answering question one and two and Dr. Rajendra, maybe the the third question, please. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, I want to say every trauma specialist should know ATLS. Most trauma life support uh, strategy because uh, it is important to assess the left rating injury. Uh, first, address the left rating injury. Then we can uh, I mean, for uh, ophthalmic injury. Then eyelid and uh, or orbit injury. And uh, CT scan of the orbit is mandatory for all trauma patients, uh, not only uh, to rule out the front body, it is also important for suspected uh, fracture of the orbital wall uh, to rule out uh, uh, globe uh, hemorrhage or orbital hemorrhage and also for integrity of the globe. Uh, I always prefer abyssation, not enucleation. And uh, I prefer uh, primary orbital implant uh, in that cases. Thank you. Excellent. Dr. Rajendra. Uh, yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Delphetri, for uh, presenting a very difficult and challenging case involving not only the globe as well as orbital adenexy and cranial injury. So first to assess the in injury involvement, whether in cranial injury is very severe, so managed by multidisciplinary approach with the neurosurgeon. And your question is that key, whether we can go for the vertical lead split uh, orbital exposure. Yes, if the exposure you need wider, if the fracture of the roof is wider, then you can uh, manage it. Otherwise, uh, neurosurgeon go for the panoramic view and they can manage uh, the roof fracture better. So, uh, so Dr. Mehbo, we brought up the thing about evisceration versus enucleation. Can you, in the interest of uh, the cases we see routinely, address the issue of potential risk of sympathetic ophthalmia? And what is the counseling required when you do an evisceration, when you put an implant inside primarily? And the medical legal consequences. Before I hand over to Dr. Purindra to give some learning tips on all the presentations. Dr. Mebu, issue of sympathetic ophthalmia oh, following yes. evisceration compared to enucleation. Uh, but uh, I, I never seen any case of sympathetic ophthalmia because it is uh, theoretically present, but practically I've never seen. Uh, so uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, nowadays, uh, we're using uh, povidone iodine and others, uh, broad spectrum and antibiotic and steroids. So I always prefer evisceration. Right. And Dr. Purnima, how about, do you think sympathetic ophthalmia is a real disease or do you think it's a theoretical disease now? It is rare, but we do have seen cases which are managed by our uh, UVR department. So in our setup uh, for trauma cases, uh, whether it is endophthalmitis or not, uh, we prefer to do uh, enucleation, not really so primary enucleation. Not, not, am I audible? Not really, an, uh, not really a primary enucleation. We try to repair it because primary enucleation after trauma, it is more traumatic to the patient. We try to do repair and then if required, we do prefer enucleation. I also agree with the Dr. Purnima because uh, prime repair will give a psychological impact yeah. to the patient. And also we can put the artificial eye later on. Great, great. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Purim Basin here. And Dr. Arthur. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I think um, all the presenters and case presentations were very, very enlightening and uh, all of them have done justice to their talk and uh, um, wonderful pre case presentations as well. And uh, we have come out with uh, uh, beautiful uh, outcomes that uh, um, the, before going further, we should yeah. evaluate the case, do it under appropriate anesthesia, especially general anesthesia. Imaging is very, very important before proceeding further. Uh, appropriate imaging by uh, various means should be done before taking the case for the surgery. And timing of surgery has been highlighted and that is very, very important in uh, posterior segment surgeries as well as in the road traffic accident and in a variety of cases of orbit uh, adenexa and the globe. So uh, when to intervene, that is very, very important in trauma to get the best outcome and best results. This is now, uh, 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 the, this science is uh, well established now. And uh, apart from this, uh, the consent should be taken for uh, the worst to come for the patient because uh, all these patients, they expect a lot out of, uh, because the science has evolved very nicely in last many years, but uh, their expectations are very high. So to be on a safer side, we should take a proper uh, consent and uh, medical legally and record it and uh, do a video recording also pre-operatively and for the consent also, we should take a video recording from the patient if it is possible or from the attendants. And uh, staged surgery, everyone has highlighted that a, a complete surgery to be done in one stage should not be uh, encouraged. We should do a stage surgery. When it is required, we should proceed for the vitreo retina surgery or we should go for other surgeries and involve other disciplinary uh, persons whenever it is required. That is what is very important in our uh, orbital and ophthalmic trauma cases. Thank you all for giving us and highlighting us all these things. And thank you, AIOS, for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences. Please conclude, Dr. Ganga. Yeah, maybe a quick word from Dr. Geeta Lisa about a major ophthalmic international meeting, ophthalmic trauma meeting, and then Dr. Arthi, you can take over. Yes, uh, so we are all professors, doctors. We hosting the eighth APOTS meeting this year in November in Bali, uh, with the theme of defying obstacles preserving the eye in ophthalmic trauma. So uh, I hope you. We'll all, after the Bali APAO next month, please come again in November, from uh, the November 8th to 10th. The APOTS meeting uh, will wait for you. We will, we will be very happy to have you in Bali in November again. Thank you. Thank we you. are coming, Dr. Gita Liza. We are coming over. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. And to participate and to interact so with all the international speakers. Thank you. And... We yeah, so, really uh, appreciate So I'll request everyone to please switch on their cameras and uh, give their uh, best smile. So I'll take an official photograph, though it's virtual. But let's have a memory. So here we go. Three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Ganga and Dr. Purendra Basin for coordinating this session so very well. The session was very informative and uh, it was a great learning. I would like to thank all the presenters and the panelists for this session to um, make their inputs and bring enlighten this topic of uh, ocular trauma. So uh, I would like to just make a quick, quick announcement. So we'll be starting our next session in Hall B at 11.45 sharp, which is on infectious keratitis, state of art diagnostics and management. So you all can log in in Hall B. Thank okay. you, everyone. Arthi, can you also send them a Thank link very much. recording today so that we can share with the residents later? Uh, recording, yes. So, uh, so uh, all the uh, fa faculties or all the pe people, those who are registered for the conference, uh, will get the recorded meeting uh, link through email, uh, maybe within a week's time. 
we have almost uh, yesterday night session was like little late night we had around 500 live audience and uh, we already crossed uh, 3000 uh, viewers so far we have registration of around 2000 people so uh, we encourage uh, we still have a full day today and the topics are really interesting like small incision cataract surgery and glaucoma so uh, you can uh, if anybody wants the audience link right away i'll share it here in the chat box so that you can share that with uh, your uh, residents thank you very much everybody all the speakers and the presenters the panelists and my good friend dr basen